Hello and welcome to today's webinar, the SDL World Server Quarterly Showcase. My name's Kate and I'll be your host. Your speaker today is Ray Hopley, Director of Product Management for SDL Word Server. We expect today's webinar will last about 30 to 35 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. I'm now going to hand you over to Ray to begin the presentation. Great, thank you very much, Kate, and welcome, everybody. Good morning, good evening. Uh, wherever you might be, welcome to the must be the fourth quarterly webinar now since we're uh, at that time of the year. I'm going to talk today uh, a slightly different topic, um, the kind of intersection of TM matching, how this influences costing, and what that might mean for your workflow. And I'm going to uh, move on to the agenda slide. Um, talk a little bit about the types of matching that you can get from uh, TEM and what they mean, how some a little bit of detail around how they're calculated, uh, what that means for the uh, process management, so that's the workflow piece, and obviously that always feeds into costing, um, and talk a little bit about things like uh, segment IDs versus TEM attributes and how you can, uh, I guess, exploit these to maximize your leverage, as it says there at the final point. So just a little bit of uh, background, so we have these pictures in our minds when I'm talking about some of the other details. When I'm talking about workflow, I'm going to talk about this two-step. Uh, it's a very simplified representation of, uh, I guess, a standard process, what the Germans call the Vier-Augen-Prinzip, which is that every uh, piece of translated content needs at least two pairs of eyes to look at it. So there is a translate step, and then there is a review uh, loop. As you can see here in World Server, we have this nice uh, reject option. We can push it back if the reviewer is unhappy. But that's just the picture I wanted to give you uh, when we're talking about workflow. It's a simplified view, but it's the principle of translate and review, standard practice. And then uh, scoping information, so we have obviously uh, fuzzy bands, and we have word counts that get uh, populated into each of those different bands. We have things like ice matching, repetitions, etc. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what they mean and what that implies then for how you can manage the workflow. So that's just a little bit of picture. So how does TM lookup actually work? How do we get our matches? And there is the answer. Nice and uh, short and sweet. Any questions? Obviously, I'm being slightly facetious. Uh, but this is indeed a representation of the edit distance calculation that we use. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, where do segments come from? So take a step back. Where do they come from? We apply uh, file type settings to any number of supported source file inputs, and from there, translatable content is extracted, depending on the translatability rules. Uh, that is just block of translatable text. It's the entire file uh, as a sequence of paragraphs, as we call them. And at that point, then we apply segmentation rules. And then this is, that means that this big block of content is segmented into smaller blocks. And typically, as I state here, the, these segments are equivalent to sentences. A sentence here is a discrete unit of meaning. Segmentation rules, just as a note here, uh, it's typically you only modify those to deal with exceptions. So there are a number of generic uh, rules that are applied that in the majority use case will extract a full uh, sentence as one segment. Things like abbreviations, which follow the same kind of character pattern, uh, full stop, period, followed by a space, followed by potentially a capital letter. That sequence normally delineates a segment boundary. But it might, in some cases, be just an abbreviation that is followed by a full stop. So you add exceptions. We ship with many of these defined out of the box from many source languages. But that's just a note. Segmentation rule is not really about segmenting. It's about when not to segment. And then once we've applied these file type settings and the segmentation rules, we have abstracted away all of the unique characteristics of whatever the input file might be. It might be an InDesign file, it might be a Word file, or a PowerPoint file, or an XML file, or any of those supported file types. But we present that in a, a sequence of segments. And those segments, as it says here, is a discrete reusable unit of meaning which is really uh, where the ROI from translation memory comes from. Right? We store those translated segment source target pairs with the purpose of reusing them in subsequent translation projects. So just the representation here, you can see this is a source document 
and it has some nice formatting, it has a little picture in there, it has some bold, and it has some various other things in there. And here we've ab abstracted it away. So some very basic definitions I'm putting together here at the beginning, just so we're all clear about what we're talking about. It does get a little bit more complex as we come back to that Levenstein equation, but uh, some things that you can see as well, tokenization happens here. So things like dates and fields and numbers are automatically recognized. We have some WYSIWYG format representation that is just in the editor itself. Right, that's uh, so we still abstracted away all those things, but we present it back in a, a friendly manner for the, the linguist to have some additional context around the structure of your source document. Okay, a lot of text on this slide uh, after the pretty pictures. How does TM uh, lookup actually work? So here is really the description of it. We do text-based comparison of the source text that you are submitting translation against the content of your translation memory. And just a little bit more detail around how that actually works. Uh, for exact matches, it's much faster not to do a string comparison. Databases don't really like strings, so we have uh, hashing and indexing. Uh, this is uh, as well as the database indexing, so that's a database technology piece. We have a linguistic index that essentially it operates in the same manner. It performs lookup faster because you're looking at less data. Hashing is really uh, an algorithmic computation of a number, an integer, based on some input, in our case, uh, a string uh, segment. And obviously, it's much faster for a database to convert that to a hash and compare those than it is to do a full text comparison. Some technical detail, but that is indeed true. Fuzzy matching, as it says, it gets a little bit more complicated, and we can't use that hashing because we know that the strings are different. So that we know for sure that they're not going to match, but they might be similar. And there is a thing called edit distance, and there's a particular implementation of a measure of edit distance called Levenstein distance, uh, named after a Russian uh, computational scientist who came up with that. And as it says there, it computes a number that represents the shortest possible transformation of one string to another. I'm going to have a look at an example of that a little bit later on. But still, it all gets a little bit more complicated, even the exact matches and as well as the fuzzy matches. Uh, we apply tokenization, for example. I mentioned you know, dates and measurements, any numeric fields. There are a number of things that you can define uh, as uh, tokens, and these are in our kind of matching mechanisms, auto-substitutable. Uh, so certain date formats might be uh, different in one target language versus another, and there is some uh, cleverness built into the matching to switch around the month and the day, for example, in US and uh, in Japanese, it's year, month, day, for example. Some of those things we can programmatically also substitute, but they don't count as words because the machine is doing the so to speak, localization. Go back to that equation again. I don't want to spend uh, too much time here is what it means, actually. It's the distance between two words, the minimum number of single character edits. So you proceed uh, changing one character at a time. And you can insert new characters, you can remove characters, or you can substitute one character for another. And you end up with uh, some kind of matrix like this. Uh, this is how to turn Saturday night into Sunday morning. Just get control of the mouse, and you'll see how I'll just walk through what happens and how we reach that number. S is S. A does not exist, so we delete it. T does not exist, so we delete it. U is U. The R needs to be substituted, and then DAY is the same. So we end up with a Levenstein distance converting this string uh, into another string of three doesn't sound like the percentage uh, calculations that we're normally expecting when we're talking about fuzzy matching, but this is the underlying method of the algorithm itself. Obviously, there are additional layers of computation and uh, manipulation of the, some of those tokens, for example, that feed into that final number. As it says here, no translator really types like this. If they're presented with a fuzzy match of Saturday, they're not going to go through and delete letter by letter. Uh, substituting one for another. But indeed, this is the basis of the calculation. Some examples. So I'm showing you the TM uh, results window here from Drado Studio, just to show you because it gives a nice view of the strike through, means that that was in the TM 
translation unit, but it's not in our new sentence. And then you'll see at the top with the underline and all the way through with the underline, this is a one new word in our uh, source segment. And compared to the three TM matches, we have varying calculations within a certain range. Right, They're very close together, and it's uh, you know, it, it, these those numbers are a result of all of that complex calculation going on underneath to figure out really uh, the similarity, this is what the, it really means, it's the similarity of one string versus another. Okay, so that's enough of the science lesson. But what does it really mean? It's a nice, very simple representation of uh, if I, I need to get my translation to be 100% correct, so that's at the top of the chart, and my TM has given me a 75% match. So what does that fuzzy number represent? actually an inverse measure of work and the, the work that it takes a translator to bring that 75% of reusable translation up to 100% fully translated representing uh, the source meaning. Okay, so it's an inverse measure of work. We know it's a measure of work because we multiply it by a cost to produce our quotes. So as well as all the clever science behind it, measuring the, how uh, quickly you can get from one version of a string to another, what we actually apply it to in our industry is measuring the amount of work, which is an interesting thing because this is only one aspect of the work, right? The two human steps coming back to our workflow. This means that the translation work is complete when my uh, translation is 100% accurate representation of the source text. But there's still work to do here, which is obviously uh, a, a different kind of calculation and a different, uh, different basis that you can use to calculate the review costs. But indeed, a 100% match is still leaves some work to be done. And it's interesting so, that we're measuring the difference on the source over here, but it's actually the target where the work is done. So I'm just going to leave that out there. It's some kind of philosophical question, right? We're measuring the distance here, but we're applying that measure, a unit of measure in terms of work over here. That's just an open question whether that's the right thing to be doing. Okay. So I said there's more work to be done at review. Or is there? This is the question. So text-based matching means 100% match, but that still leaves review work to be done. What mechanisms do we have to actually elevate that exact string match to the point where the reviewer doesn't need to do anything? Context is the answer. And in our world, that means additional metadata that actually elevates the confidence in the correctness, the exactness of the text-based match. So as well as the string being identical, there are other pieces of information which are identical, and these allow us then to consider a 100% match above a regular text-based 100% match, and we call these context matches, of course. And the goal here, really the business goal, is to eliminate any human effort at all for those particular segments. So here we have TM matching technology influencing the cost, because cost of work equals cost. And how does this feed into the workflow? So we're going to come to that. And of course, there are multiple definitions of context. Different tools have them within WorldServe itself. We have uh, at least two, which I'm going to talk about now. And there are a couple of other things that we have uh, our R&D backlog in the pipeline for 2019 about uh, defining additional factors that we can consider the same kind of boost for the confidence that this is indeed a fully correct translation for where it's being utilized. Interestingly, there are other things that you can do where you force a mismatch, and these will demote rather than promote a match. So you have 100% matches. TM attributes is the most common uh, use case here. So you set a project attribute, and you store that same value against the translation units in your TM. And when you're creating a project, if you select a value from a drop-down, let's say it's printer, scanner, photocopier, so you've got three different types of product, and your translation unit has scanner set against it because that was the manual you were translating. If you now choose to translate the photocopier manual, you can force it to mismatch those values 
because it, it's following what the uh, particular document is talking about in order to force a review. So it goes both ways, this influencing the match, and these are additional parameters that you can configure in the system that will can force either the promotion of a match so that there's, it has this con extra context and then no review, or even if uh, the text is the same, you're forcing a mismatch and therefore you are insisting on the review step, just so that we have control both ways. Okay. Ice matching. So we're familiar with in-context exact matching. And the way that this works is every translation unit in the TM knows the segments that came before it and after it in the original document when it was translated. We actually compute, again, these hash values. So I'll show you in a moment. Uh, we don't store, again, the same string, because that would lead to a massive uh, duplication within the database. Uh, less storage. Databases love integers. So they hate strings, and they love integers. So much faster. What, that re what I'm really saying there is it's much faster to deal with uh, integer comparisons than it is with string comparisons. And these are used to elevate. Uh, so they're like TM attributes, but they're used to elevate the match above the 100%. There isn't such a thing mathematically, of course, but it's beyond that. So the context value also matches, and that means that this translation came from identical sequence of segments in the previous document. So it's as though you're reusing a block of text that comprises of not just the segment you're translating, but the one before it and the one after it. And if those two... Uh, neighboring pieces of content are also the same, then the assumption is that this 100% match must be reusing that same block. Therefore, your translation, which has been through the review process already, no longer needs to go through that review process. Here's an example of how they're represented. So this is a TMX export. You'll see we have the text. We don't store the text of the previous version or the next segment. We have computed a value. Uh, it's not very friendly for a human to read, but obviously uh, in the back end it's much better, like I said, to deal with those integer values. But just to show you that you know we uh, store everything uh, that's a neighbor of the segment with the segment itself. Then we have an additional definition of context, which is something quite different, actually. Even though it has a very similar name, the segment ID, which has been nicely abbreviated to spice matching. Uh, there is further uh, here a, a metadata on each segment, but it's generated as part of the uh, text extraction. So I mentioned at the beginning where the segments come from. The, there are certain file types, and we'll come to that at the end, where that process of extracting the text can extract another piece of data from the source file itself and associate that with the segment. And then when it's updated into the TM, it's associated with the translation unit. They're persisted, as it says there, as the SID value. So I call them SID sometimes, but I mean segment ID. And it's a TM attribute of sorts, but it's dynamically generated as we're doing that text extraction from the source file itself. And because of that, again, this is from the, the context, it's stored uh, against the translation unit and is considered to be, again, the, providing this extra level of confidence because we've generated it in the source file, we store it in the TM, and then we compare the two. And if those two pieces of metadata are the same, then we have a, a, you know, a different definition of context, but one that's considered equally to elevate that 100% match to context, which means no review. And the interesting point here at the bottom is that it's not dependent on the sequence of segments being from the same version of the source, one source file to the next. It's actually uh, based on the ID itself. So that could move around anywhere in a file. One of the key use cases for this kind of uh, additional context is in the software localization world, where there are a number of uh, machine-generated versions of resource string files. And it doesn't really matter which order the strings come out in because we're using the ID, which is always consistent to do that extra level of confidence and context matching. So here's an example of how it works. Here's my source file. Clearly some simple XML, but it has these obviously machine-generated GUIDs. Everything has an ID. And this GUID here, which is really the value of this ID attribute on the title element, has been extracted 
when we're doing that file pre-processing at the beginning, or so before we even apply the TM, we've already extracted this piece of data and associated it with this segment, which is a single word in this case, caution, but nonetheless, it proves the example. Here you can see in the translation memory, we're storing that as a kind of system attribute on the, that translation unit, and we're using it here for matching. As you can see, the representation is actually 100% ICE, although the mechanism that's actually delivering that in context exact match is this SID matching, rather than the uh, sequence number, the hash of the previous and next segments. Okay. So the file types that support SID generation, we have Java properties file type, so the key name, which is the thing that's on the left of uh, the structure, very, very simple structure to the Java properties files. It's key name on the left, which is the ID, the resource ID, and then an equal sign, and then the text afterwards. You can also have things like placeholders and other uh, programmatically generated content that's uh, put in, um, but for the benefit of uh, providing the context, it's this, which a developer has named. This is the key name, and it will, all, even though they might change the text, this will always stay the same, and therefore we use this as that extra level of context. And we have custom XML file type. This is a little bit more complicated. So for this one in World Server, there in the uh, FTS Java properties file, there is no UI for configuring the segment ID generation. It's always on, and it will always be generated, whether you choose to use it or not, but it's always there in the background. Um, but because of the simplistic nature of the structure, it's key equals value. It can only ever be this, so there is no need to provide a UI for that. It's always that. In custom XML file type, it's a little more complex, as you saw in that example. And you have to use some XPath notation to identify here. You can see uh, it's the ID value of both the note and title elements that we've defined in our parser rules here that are used then, again, during that pre-processing phase to extract uh, the particular value. And you know it's dynamic based on the source file, but it's stored again in translation memory and then matched against the subsequent version of that file. Very good also for things like mid-project update can really benefit from this kind of thing um, because you've got that extra guarantee that the ID has not changed between versions. Okay, so a kind of uh, in a whistle-stop tour here of matching and there's some uh, details that are provided around you know, how that works and what that means really, but from a workflow perspective, we can think of it uh, like this. So that we do have this auto action that we ship as part of the product, and it has three exit transitions. One is for all ice matching, so they can bypass review, as you can see here. And then we've got the exact matches, those are your 100%, which go straight to review. And then any partial fuzzy matches will go to the translate step and go through that two uh, step process of translation and review because they need that because they don't have the additional benefit of uh, the context that's been provided to them. So yeah, again, a whistle stop tour through uh, some leveraging, uh, I guess, back end detail and implementation detail. But really, the goal here is about reducing costs by maximizing the leverage. And it's something to think about if you are not benefiting currently from the use of segment IDs, for example, which we recently introduced, uh, well, recently, a couple of years ago. They were always there in the legacy filter framework, but we introduced them with the FTS file types, uh, XML and Java properties. And with uh, the next release next year, we'll also be adding SID support to the JSON file type, yet another uh, very common format these days for localizing software strings and uh, passing data around. Not my favorite file format, very, uh, very loose. Um, it's not even, well, it's more flexible than the Java properties because it has nesting and hierarchy, but that makes it more complex in terms of parser rules. Um, but it's still, you can have, uh, back, have uh, segment ID values, typically uh, some kind of resource string ID that's included in the JSON that you can use for that additional context. So that's uh, about 25 minutes in, so a little bit of five minutes ahead of time. That's 
last uh, presentation I want to share with you today. If you're not utilizing some of this functionality, the uh, advanced routing workflow mechanism that I've got here in the segment ID, then I'll encourage you to look at that or ask me questions about it if you have any. I've clearly bamboozled you all. Uh, no questions. Or well, maybe it's too early in your day. You're still digesting Levenstein distance with your coffee. Give it another moment for some questions. Okay, I don't think we have any, Kate. I don't know if you can see some that I can't, but I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ray. Thanks for presenting today. No, it doesn't look like we've got any questions come in. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for attending the webinar. Um, the recording will be available shortly, and uh, we will also be sending um, a copy to everyone who's actually registered for the webinar. Oh, we have just got a question come in. Ray, do you want to answer that? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it's not in the immediate plans, but I can certainly put it on the backlog. Um, you know, you'd have to. I, I, I need to understand that a little bit. Uh, what you would want to use from HTML5. I'm not sure if everybody can see the question. The question is, will spice matching become available for the HTML5 uh, file type? And the, the answer is, it's not in the immediate roadmap, so it's not in the next release. But uh, if there's a significant enough use case. It, it, and it makes sense, then sure. It, it, like I said, the, these are kind of additional mechanisms that you can use that actually end up saving you money. Um, so the, the you know return on investment is uh, kind of obvious calculation to make. So yeah, good idea. I can add that to the backlog. Okay, great. Thanks, Ray. Um, I think we'll finish there, and um, Ray will provide you the details for that question. So maybe you can follow up with the uh, with the person directly after the event. Watching. Yep. Very good. Um, yep. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, we hope you found today's session useful, and we look forward to welcoming you on, on one of our next webinars. Lovely. Great. Thanks. Have a great rest of the day.